Hey everybody and welcome back to the Unreal Engine live stream. I'm your host Alexander Baskell and joining me today is Zach Parrish. Hey, how's it going? Um, we're going to be talking about the photorealistic character sample that is now available on the Learn tab on your launchers. Uh, but first, uh, we're going to talk about the news. And, oh, I have to <laughs> hop over. We have some stuff available. There we go. Web browsing is hard. You know, you know, tabs, they're everywhere. Um, so first things up, we've got a whole bunch of new blog posts and showcases. So the first one you want to check out is uh, Architectural Visualization Webinar. Fabrice Burley is doing, and I hope I pronounced his last name right, um, Fabrice is doing a really good con uh, talk on the 27th. You can register it for it on our blog here. Uh, it goes to this post over here. Just go to unrealengine.com slash blog. This is currently at the top of our blog, but it's Architectural Visualization Webinar. We'll take you right to it. And then you can sign right up for it and check it out. If you're in ArcViz, you'll want to take a look at this one. It's very awesome. Next up, uh, we have a good talk here. Uh, so if you're not familiar with Stolen Steel, it's a VR title that was made by Joe Wintergreen. It's currently available on Steam, and it's basically a dueling game where you duel against various bad guys in medieval steampunky world of its own. It's very interesting, but if you want to see a lot of the behind the scenes and get some interesting quotes about game development in Unreal and what he had to go through to make some very interesting, strange, and, uh, well, fun mechanics like breaking a bottle over people's heads, this is what you're going to read. Uh, I think he has a really good quote in here. It breaks, oh yeah, he talks about breaking a bottle over people's heads. He couldn't quite figure out the amount of newtons you needed to apply, so he guessed repeatedly, and it breaks it about be, uh, what is it? It breaks after being hit by 300 or more newtons of force or something. I'm not sure exactly because physics is tough. Well, I guess that beats going out and getting the proper equipment, <laughs> attaching it to a bottle and standing under it. <laughs> this is like, yeah, yeah, trying to figure it out, having to have like a machine that repeatedly smashes a bottle yeah. until you get the right like PSI. All right. Uh, so this is a uh, stolen steel VR on Steam. Just showing off the web page for it too. Really awesome game. And he's also working on uh, a game that seems to be sort of a spiritual sequel to it, which is more thief-like, but uses a lot of these mechanics. Um, and he seems to put this out as kind of a intermittent uh, in-between game. So cool. Check it out. It's, it's a lot of fun. Not like the the edgier sequel to Borrowed Steel. There's. There's a uh, right. <laughs> I, I'll see myself out now. <laughs> Welcome to the pun stream. <laughs> we we might have been Thanks, telling everyone. We might have been telling puns before this and all that. So yeah. Um, all right. Uh, another showcase that's recently been put up is really fun here. Uh, if you've not checked it out yet, last year is another asymmetric, um, sort of like there's like the Friday the Thirteenth game. There's um, these. Uh, what's the other one that they, they talk about it in here? Uh, Until Dawn, that's it. Uh, they talk about uh, how you make a game that's one kind of asymmetric, two a horror game, and then three, yeah, like you have a whole team of people and you have to like start axing them off, making sure it's interesting in narrative. Then you have this whole discussion here about cliches and the horror world in general and how that ends up playing into the games that we've been seeing coming out lately. So check out this interview. You're going to see a lot of good questions and answers for horror game developers and people who are working on asymmetric uh, multiplayer games. So this one's for you right here. Well, that's got to be interesting, because I always felt those asymmetric games had to be kind of tricky to balance, right? Because oh, yeah. off the cuff, the first thing y you think of is like, well, that's only going to be fun for the person who gets to run around with the axe and kill everybody. Well, you'd think, and then like you have to make it so that the kids also see she's got an axe too, but it's only going to do so much damage. You can, you yeah, can kind of like, mess with them. Yeah, but like if I had them, to choose yeah. between playing as her or playing with uh, as the guy with the hockey mask. Okay. I'm going hockey mask. Also. Clearly hockey mask. I don't know. I feel like realistically, I'd be the one with the braces who's cowering in the corner there a little bit. That'd be me in real life, though. So yeah, yeah. I see. Like, I see what's happening here. <laughs> I get this. Please don't murder me. Is all I'm asking for. Gotcha. gotcha. Yeah. Okay. You know. So um. Let's see. Oh, and yeah, last year has a really great looking website. I just want to show you last year the game. Check it out. Also, if you haven't watched the trailers for it and the various videos for it, also come out to their site and take a look. And. Um, Oh, this is the documentation. We'll get back to that in a second. Yeah. Da -da -da. <laughs> it's a future <laughs> preview of what we're going to do in a second. Pow. All right. Hopping back wow. on in, we're going to talk about community spotlights really quickly, and then we're going to jump into the project. Community spotlights, where we like to highlight uh, you all, uh, the people who watch the stream, not us here who go off and write blogs and do all that, but you who create and help each other out, just to give you guys a, you know, a little bit of love. Uh, first up, 
on answers.unrealengine.com, you can post your questions, your answers, etc. about Unreal Engine. People come here if they have a problem, if they're curious about how to design something, or for a bug report. If you come in and help each other out, you get karma points for getting upvotes and likes and all the little um, bumps like that. And we c accumulate it all into a weekly karma high score. So uh, this is our high score. Zach, since you're here, would you like to uh, read off the, the names on the high score list? You just don't, you just don't want to have to pronounce some of this stuff. Uh, see what's what? No, I love, uh, I love badly pronouncing names. Yeah, right, right. right. So uh, <coughs> let's see, this week's uh, top karma score, we have Wormlock, 83, Yay! 140 karma points. You get a badge. Yeah, and then we have Benergy at 137. Yay, uh, you've already got a bet. <laughs> I, I feel like I should just start mispronouncing them on purpose, but I'm going to try not to. So Venlac, I think, at 135. Yeah. Shadow River at 95. Uh, Bpandru. 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 <laughs> I know you got that one wrong. Cause, mm -hmm. Yeah, uh. Bp Andrew. Ah, right? Uh, no, I get it, but like underscore something. Help me out here. Uh, <laughs> Vahiva at 65, iGorilla at 65, Aussie Burger at 55, Money G at 55, and Ilarvan. 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 Only. At 45. I think only Zach Parrish is the man who's capable of discerning a capital I from a lowercase L in like There's any spacing. font at all. There's spacing. But can you tell if that's two? Maybe it's a cap. Maybe it's a lowercase L and then two capital I's, and it's Liar. No. Um. If it, if that was the case, then the letters would be closer on the right hand side because lowercase L has tighter spacing. See this? See this? He knows his stuff. Graphic design <laughs> degree. Honestly, it's that's the. I, I studied this for a whole minute. That's incredible. Yep. I never considered that was something to I'm also kind of making it up. You can't usually <laughs> count on that, but but for the most part, you can use that as a rule of thumb. I will just buy anything you say. Okay, I know. I know. It. It's all in got how it. you say it. <laughs> Stone face that stuff. I got sold, man. All, all right. right. So uh, first community spotlight that we want to put, uh, put forward here. Uh, this is really cool. It's a new website that's been put out by, and I know I'm going to get this wrong because uh, I've tried to say it before, uh, El Hasun Menik. Uh, and he's been a really awesome resource in our community, uh, just a really awesome guy. He's made UE4Resources.com, which is exactly what it sounds like. It's just a repository of all of these projects and ideas and thoughts that he's uh, made here. You can just Call take a look. the big L. Yeah, the big L. The big L. L. Yeah, he's, he's been making some pretty interesting stuff. Very. Yeah, uh, these are awesome. Yeah, if you've not actually had a chance to check him out before, uh, please take a look. These are all here to download. Uh, they're really good jumping off points for your own projects. Think of them as like super templates, like where we give you some base templates. He goes in and just goes nuts with them. So please come check out his site and everything he's offering here. He's also got a really great breakdown of stuff. He has YouTube videos and a great breakdown on the forums where he got this thing started forever ago, just kind of documenting all the fun stuff he was working on. As you can see, it's a very extensive thing and there's a lot of discussion behind it. Um, just Really awesome, and thank you so much, buddy. It, we really appreciate all the cool stuff you made. Absolutely. Uh, next up, Starfighter if Inc. It makes, if it makes anybody oh. feel better, I have actually pointed uh, AAA devs at some of his stuff. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I, I, I actually pointed uh, Chris Wilson over to his thing because Chris was trying to make a AI that could like jump across platforms, and I was like sitting there fiddling with it, and then he just drops that like no yep. time afterwards. So I was like, yeah, just you take that. <laughs> It'll be a lot easier. Um, so what we have next, Starfighter Inc. They just had a successful Kickstarter. Really, uh, really happy for these guys. I actually got to meet them at ECGC. Like yeah. a few of them were there, wandered up, said hi, asked a bunch of questions. They look like they're really interested in a lot of cool tech. I just wanted to bring you uh, bring attention to this one if you're not familiar with it already and you like space games. Uh, if you like things like Star Citizen, etc., this is another one to check out. They're very, very well put together. It's tight. The graphics are nice. Like graphics are very nice. I mean, do that for you. I was hoping that was a lot bigger. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like, well, that just it's got rid of everything else on the screen. Kind of helped. Good focus. <laughs> but yes, it's very nicely put together, and you can see how they've broken down everything. It's very thought out ship design, and um, the way you can kind of make alterations is really cool too. Uh, they're also I'm getting dizzy. I know. <laughs> it's a little spin action. They're looking at stuff like Houdini and how to make modular pieces and mm -hmm. parts. It's very clever design. So yeah, just check it out. A lot of fun. And uh, they have a nice website, too. Uh, yep, there you go. Impellerstudios.com. You can see their progress, sign up for the newsletter and all that good stuff, and get updates. Pretty. Nice. All right, so next up, I have a couple of tutorials for you from Stephen Toe. Stephen Two? It's T. -O what do you think? Two or Toe? I don't know. All right. Stephen, thank Steve. you. Steve. <laughs> Big Steve. It's got to be Toe. 
Stephen T. Big T. That's what we're calling him. So we really appreciate this one here. But you, you, uh, sorry. We really appreciate this. It's a virtual reality development with Unreal Engine 4 breakdown. It's lots of tips, guides, tricks, um, and just good advice. Good getting started advice stuff. Um, I'm, I'm not going to go over exactly everything, but as you can see, it's an extensive breakdown on things you need to be aware of, scale, uh, etc. We've done a couple of getting started with VR uh, video tutorials. We have a couple of documentation pages about it as well. So if you like those and you need more, check this one out. He also provides you with like a little bit of code to mess around with here and there, which is nice. Everyone likes getting a nice code snippet to play with. And it's very extensive and has a part two of it as well uh, for interaction between objects in virtual reality in Unreal Engine 4, where he breaks down, basically he breaks down the template, the VR template, um, where you can, you know, yeah, grab yeah, objects yeah. and move them around. The and one we have. You know, the, the good one, uh, the one that Tom worked on. Yeah. Good guy. Um, and so, yeah, you can just kind of see where he explores, breaks it down, and, and further uh, just explains everything to you. So, Awesome. Really good. Thank you so much, Stephen. All right, those are all of our community spotlights of the day. And now we can get on to the main event. Zach, thank you. Hi. That hey. was man, that was that was hardcore. You blasted yeah. through all that. Yeah, yeah. I, I have to I have a lot of news stuff. I always go through it. I like to make sure it gets done well. Well, today we're gonna be taking a look at the photorealistic character example that we just released over on the marketplace. Mm -hmm. uh, it's been a, a long time coming. Actually, um, I got to write the documentation for this. And there's a couple of hints buried in the doc of how long it's been coming because I think there's one reference in there to 413 I was like oh <laughs> yeah we we did yeah. start this a long time ago yeah, there's, but it, there's, a, there's also a, there was a forum thread also yeah. where people were originally requesting it and you can see some of our people me included yeah. coming in there occasionally being like we are working on it and well <laughs> Uh, you know, and it is one of those things. Like from from the other side of the screen, I know it's uh, it probably all looks a little different. I'm sure it, it gets. Mm -hmm. I'm sure I can fill you with a certain level of impatience. Um, you know, waiting for us to get this stuff out there. So apologies for how long it took to actually get out. But there were a lot of factors on getting this content out. Uh, the short version of the story is originally this was going to be Twin Blast Head, like the actual character from Paragon. And there's a lot of back and forth as to whether or not that was smart. And then so we ended up having to. Uh, put out different content instead. So you might have noticed if you haven't looked yet, this actually looks a lot like Twin Blast as I fly right into his head. Yeah, it's uh, Twin Twin. Yeah, it's it's not though. Like his jawline is is kind of wrong. So this is more representative of the actual actor that we scanned to create Twin Blast. So this looks like the the real human being who was the basis for Twin Blast than it does Twin Blast himself. So Twin Blast is a little cosmetic surgery done on his face. Something like that. All right, yeah, all right. yeah. So um, actually, I'm, I'm, I do this every time I look at this project. I take the field of view on the camera and set it to 45. It just makes me a little less likely to fly into the mesh as I uh, rotate around it. Also, I think somebody mentioned early on, like there's some blurring and some bloom and other things. Like if you create a new camera in here and start looking through it, look a, a little bit weird. A lot of that is just post-processing. Like if you jump into this project and you hit play, there's this highly tailored video that uh, that we've put together. And actually this went through a whole lot of iterations with a whole bunch of our look dev people staring at it and, and constantly tweaking and making changes to make sure that it looked as pretty as it could be. But uh, if you're just kind of checking this out on your own, Usually what I do is the first, first thing is I'll set field of view down to 45. Uh, I will frame up on the guy so I can easily alt drag to rotate around it and then because I'm kind of picky about this sort of thing I will go under uh, show post processing and turn off uh, any depth of field and that just keeps everything nice and sharp uh, so if you're like complaining or, or concerned about any sort of blurriness that's probably how to get rid of it so um, the first thing I, I wanted to talk about or at least wanted to bring up because I've already had some folks in the community and actually in the industry reach out to me uh, it should be it should be immediately clear what this demo is for and what it is not for, mm -hmm. uh, because uh, the the day we released it, I got flooded with a bunch of emails from folks again, like community and, and industry folks who are like, well, it doesn't show this and it doesn't oh, it doesn't have teeth, it doesn't have a tongue, it doesn't have clothes, it doesn't have a weapon, it doesn't have a body. It's like there's there's a lot of things it doesn't have. So let me uh, just start off by telling you what this was intended to do. And the other stuff that it could do, yeah, we totally recognize we could do that, but we uh, we want to just focus on these things first, and I'll, I'll, tr I'll do my best to explain why and at least put it into scope. So our goal here was to allow you to see a realistic workflow for skin, hair, and eyes especially. Like th those were those were the big ones that we really want to make sure that everybody understood was uh, skin, hair, and eyes because getting those right 
is tricky. And uh, previous to our work with Paragon, I'm pretty sure that technically speaking, it was not possible. You couldn't get skin, you could get skin pretty close. We've actually had a skin shader in Unreal for a while and it was pretty good. Uh, making really good looking eyes was a trick. Uh, or, and we actually employed a lot of trickery to get anything even close to a realistic eye back then. And hair was just right out uh, because you couldn't get that anisotropic specular highlight off hair. Like as, as you must your hair up and like all of the different strands are going in different directions, you want your specular highlight to dance around and do different things. Um, so getting all of that to work in the shader required some work. We had to write custom shaders for all this stuff. Yeah, it seems like a, like the eye mesh itself had to be built around like yeah. the, all that too, yeah. Well, I'll get to that. That's oh, okay. its own... Uh, can of worms? Uh, I was going to say bowl of udon because I like noodles. Ah, okay. That's its own bowl of udon. Uh, but anyway, so once we got all of this work done, we decided that we really needed to show it off to people because we ended up with this situation. We have all this new technology, all this great new character rendering technology, and nobody but us knows how to use it. So uh, we've been kind of slowly eking out some training. I think actually in content examples at one point, we got an example of an early eye shader and a simplistic example of the hair shader out, but it wasn't quite enough. And so we recognized that uh, we'd actually, we felt pretty strong, uh, strongly and confident about how the end result of the Paragon characters. So we wanted to get that result out to everybody, but not in a way that compromised Paragon. And there's a really delicate balancing act there for a lot of reasons. Absolutely. And it, Intellectual and, property is a thing. Uh, absolutely. It, it, we actually have kind of dove into Paragon characters specifically as yeah. well in the past. There's a stream like almost exactly a year ago. It might be a year and a couple months now. But, it is a but, year and a couple months. Yeah, because it was January last year, wasn't it, that, yep. we, uh, that we actually brought some of the as artists uh, on. And, and Jordan Walker and Brian Karras. Yes, sir. And uh, actually, so their talk uh, is linked in the documentation for this because a lot of the documentation stems from the stuff that they talked about. Uh, so again, that's what this is here to do. This is here to show you like our approach to human characters, primarily just focusing on the face. If you were like, yeah, but it doesn't show teeth. I mean, yeah, but you sh hopefully, uh, in an ideal world, you should be able to kind of interpolate how you would approach teeth. There are some tricks that you probably have to do uh, to make the inside of the mouth look right because you need to fake how dark it gets inside. But honestly, you can probably interpolate a lot of that stuff from some of the tricks you see, particularly like on the uh, on the eye. And some of that we'll go over here in just a few minutes. <clears throat> Actually, I guess with that, we might as well just go ahead and jump in. So. Um, you can take a look at the, uh, the object itself. Looks like uh, we were searching for something here in the details panel. Let me clear that out. And, oh, uh, let's see. Uh, I'm trying to rename it, and I'm not wanting to rename it. So, ah, there we go. Get rid of depth in search. So when you select this guy, you get a big, long list of all the different materials that are applied. You should definitely check all of these out, and you should open them all up, because they are more than just a, a demonstration of how the different parts work. They're actually a demonstration of how we're doing stuff in Paragon, uh, which is pretty cool. So like, if you grab the skin bust material, and you crack that open, and it opens up on the wrong window, so I'll bring it over so everybody can see it. Uh, this is, are we in 415? Yeah, oh, I, yeah I guess we're we're we would have to be. Uh, yeah. So this does expose a bug. Before anybody points it out, I'll point it out first. Uh, if we take this guy's static mesh and we select it over here in the content browser and we go over to the material editor and we show that, I'll show you the bug. Uh, we're aware of it. We'll probably, I mean, we'll fix it one day. You might notice this does not look like skin on him at all. Uh, the point of showing you that is do not rely on this window to have any idea what skin looks like. Uh, throw it into a scene somewhere and actually throw some lights on it to have an idea. Unfortunately, you can't really use the lighting in here as a clear indication of what your skin actually looks like. There's more work that goes on in your scenes viewport. So I realize it's a little bit inconvenient. Sorry about that. But that's uh, that's the way it goes. At least we're aware of it. Yeah, as long as uh, as long as everybody's aware of it, then you can uh, you can still get your work done. So, so pro tip. When you look uh, inside this material, it looks super basic because uh, you just have the, the different textures. We'll talk briefly about what each of these do. Uh, and you'll see some parameters for roughness and things you might expect on a subsurface uh, profile material. But they all feed into this uh, material function called ML Skin Bust. And you can jump inside this, and this is straight up. This is like straight out of Paragon. This is how we're setting up uh, human skin in Paragon. In fact, You'll even notice it's disconnected in this example, but we left it floating in here. There's actually the quality switch setting that we have uh, when we're throwing this onto lower end hardware. 
uh, which not to point out exactly what that lower end hardware might be, but uh, if you if you are trying to run a competitive game like Paragon at a high frame rate, like 60 hertz, it's possible you might need to make trade-offs. Yes. And all of the ways in which we considered making trade-offs are still floating around in here, so you can see kind of what we're doing. Like we have uh, the entire detail mesh, or I'm sorry, detail normal stuff for the mesh to get like the, the pores on pores kind of look. We bypass all of that, and we have just a simple version, which is really just base color and normal and that's fed into our low quality switch. And it's just floating out here. Normally, this might be plugged in like so. But we just bypassed it because for the sake of this example, we just want to show off the higher end. Uh, but knowing that it's there and knowing that you can make decisions like that is actually pretty cool. It, yeah, it's, yeah. A, it's kind of a, a window into like forward thinking. Like, What if this project that I'm making that looks so beautiful needs to go onto a lower spec machine? Mm. How do I make decisions like that? Well, it's cool. You can just grab one of these quality switch uh, nodes and then start hooking different networks into that or different uh, shader graphs. And then you can switch out uh, using your different hardware profiles, which is pretty nifty. Oh, yeah. It's, it's scalability is really important. Yep. Okay, so uh, we'll jump out here. I'm not going to, I'm not going to read you the documentation, and I'm not going to go over exactly how all of these shaders work. Uh, it's it's way outside the scope here. My my goal is really just to kind of introduce you to this demo and talk to you about the kind of things that you'll find inside of it. Uh, so let's go ahead and move on. Actually, real quick, uh, let me jump over to the uh, the documentation. So actually, I wrote this. If you find problems in it, you're welcome to yell at me. It's fine. It was all his fault. It's totally all my fault. Uh, it was me bugging the rendering engineers uh, probably more than I should. Uh, so there's a breakdown of all of the different types of textures that go into the skin and what their jobs are, uh, exactly what their names are so that you can find them. Uh, and then like it links to further documentation. So for example, like if you want to know more about subsurface profile as a, a shader, you can uh, click on this link. It'll take you to that part of the docs and so on. So let's move on to the hair. Now hair is one of those things that before we did all of this work for Paragon, Again, it was really tricky to get right. Uh, there was a guy in the forums for a long time who uh, he had written a shader that faked uh, an isotropic uh, specularity on hair, and he did a pretty good job with it, but it, it worked by taking a vector into your material, so it really only would work from like a single directional light. Uh, you could probably have added more in, but at some point it gets you're you're almost rewriting a render inside the shader. Like you'd have to take in vector information from all these different lights and everything, and it's it'd just be a royal pain. So we ended up writing our own system for this. And if I select, not oh, hang on, I didn't mean to hide him. I just wanted to frame up on him and then hit G a couple times and then kind of look at his hair and rotate around. So uh, I recognize before anybody says anything about it. Yes, it could be more useful if this was a character who had longer hair, but we can talk briefly about really some of the changes, because at the end of the day, long hair versus short hair is not that different in terms of shading. There's a couple more things that you should know, and um, a lot of that is already covered inside the, the documentation. And also physics. Uh, well, th that depends on how you want to go with it, too. Because um, like, it, if you take a look at... Uh, uh, Sparrow, for example. Yeah. She's got like the, the long, uh, like Katniss Everdeen kind of braid Bony tail, thing yeah. going. Yeah. And so that you would end up setting up by way of like a bone chain, like a single bone chain. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we have characters like, um, I'm so bad at the actual final names on the Paragon characters. I just remember their code What names. are they like? And I'll tell you the final name. The vampire girl. Oh, uh, Countess. Countess, thank you. Countess. I, I remember her original name. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was just like, I, I do that all that, the but time. But that's not her name anymore. Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah, I, I called, uh, what was it? Uh, Kalari. Yeah, mm -hmm. we, yeah. We always uh, we always call her by the internal name because we're just it's so similar. Are we not supposed to say the internal? name? I don't know. I think well, actually, actually, uh, okay. So then it's I don't imagine Clint it would know because Clint does those streams too. So Kurahane. Yeah, Kurahane was the original name, and then uh, with and then Kalari. Yeah, the actual name. yeah, yeah. It's the final name. And then Va was it Vampiris or something? Vamp. It was vamp. vamp. Yeah, That's it was it. Just vamp. vamp. And then. Uh, the, the other one I still have a real hard time with is uh, Feng Mao being uh, Arcblade, because Arcblade was such a cool name. <laughs> so I was just like, just call him Arcblade, that's great. Anyway, jumping all the way back around. Like, if, if it was for a ponytail, you'd probably do a bone chain, and then you'd simulate that using something like Anim Dynamics, or coming soon, uh, Immediate Mode Physics, which will be experimental, I think, in 4.16. In Anim Dynamics, I believe that's also called Flappy Bits. It's very important. Dangly bits. Dangly bits. Dangly bits. Oh, Get yeah, it right. dangly bits. Got it, yes. Uh, but like if you were doing sheets of hair on either side of the face, kind of like what Vamp has now, yeah. you might do that with like a fabric or cloth simulation. So there's, there's all kinds of ways to go about that simulation process. Anyway, jumping back over to the hair shader, and if we take a look 
here. I'm trying to, I'm looking from like really far away. Uh, so let's see, there's the hair. There we go. We can open up the shader for it. And there's a whole bunch of settings in here to actually control what this looks like. Now, uh, again, I'm not necessarily here to teach you all of the different uh, values for how this works. They're all pretty well documented, I think. And if you get in here and play with them, I think you'll find that most of them are fairly self-explanatory. But you do have some fun things like uh, the, the root color and the tip color, which, again, this guy's hair is currently so dark that it's not really going to make uh, a whole lot of difference. Uh, but we can start adjusting things like his scatter value for how much light passes through the hair and whatnot and get um, really different looks for his hair. Like if I start increasing scatter, his hair starts to kind of go blonde. And really uh -huh. what we're doing here is we're approximating what would happen if more light passed through this color of hair. Uh, which uh, I think physically speaking it couldn't happen with really dark hair, which is why you start getting really weird tones. So if you want to have lighter hair, uh, you would start with a lighter base color texture than what we have for this guy. But we would expect you to go into uh, Texture Package X, you know, Photoshop or uh, GIMP or whatever, and actually lighten up those textures and muck around with them yourself just a little bit. And, uh, and there's a dandruff slider too, right? There's not a dandruff slider. And I mean, in my case, you would do that with a particle system, a pretty dense particle system, might I add. Uh, so you could do like tip color so like here this is like what i look like after what i'm starting to look like now with um kind of brown roots and pink tips of the hair like you can do this kind of thing but we'll cancel that and leave that out you now don't give pink hair uh not today okay. i mean there's there's enough of that on the screen honestly <laughs> don't, don't need pink hair overload uh, so the uh, the documentation for this actually goes into all of the mechanics for what's going on here. Um, a lot of this is the kind of stuff that you usually only find in white papers for how this works, but it is pretty dumbed down. It's not like the actual math equations for how we handled all this. I left that to Brian Karras. Uh, but there is a special thanks to uh, Eugene De Eon who uh, authored the white paper from which a lot of this came from, which is pretty cool. Oh, wow. And this is a, an approximation. This is a, a version, if you will, of the same hair shader that Weta Digital actually uses for uh, characters in their movies like Planet of the Apes and whatnot. So that's kind of nifty. Uh, so at a super high level, again, without jumping all the way down to uh, more or less reading you the documentation, the idea of the hair shader is really based around uh, the fundamental principles of how hair works and how it interacts with light. So light does kind of, when you really dumb it down, light does three different things when it hits a strand of hair. It will either bounce off it entirely or it will pass through it, it'll refract, like right here. It goes through, it goes through one side and comes out the other or it will refract into the hair, reflect off the inside of the hair, and then come back out somewhere near the original side it came from, absorbing some of the color of the hair on the way. Now what this means in practical terms is that the first one, so you know, this GIF animation I can't change, so it's just cycling through one, two, and three. So when you see one come around, one is just the light bouncing off the surface of the hair. And what that will tend to give you is the white specular highlight that comes off your hair, or really whatever color your light was. Let's assume the, the light was white, so that would give you a white specular highlight. Obviously, if it was a red light, it would give you a red specular highlight. Uh, if you, now the, the second number, so when two rolls around, we see light going into the hair and out the, the other side. That would just be light scattering through the body of hair. Uh, and that's kind of like what I was playing with uh, over here. If I try to make the most of my screen space and I scroll down and start messing with the, uh, the scatter slider. So as I increase this, this is approximating what would happen if more light passed through the body of hair. It just appears lighter. Now, this lightens up your hair en masse. Uh, just keep that kind of thing in mind. And let's see if I alt-tab foo back over here. The final one is where light enters the hair, refracts off the, or I'm sorry, it refracts through, bounces or reflects off the inside of the hair, and then comes back out. And this is where you actually get the second specular highlight that you'll see in hair, where it has picked up a little bit of the color of the hair. So if you have someone with red hair, you will see a specular, like a second specular highlight that is a little bit red. It's picking up some of that uh, actual hair color. And it's a little hard to make out here on uh, the, the twin blasty kind of character, but you're starting to see a little bit of it here. If I kick the scatter way up, you might notice that we've got some kind of pale whitish specular highlights on some of these strands of hair, 
And then some other specular highlights that are starting to get kind of like a, a burnt orange. And that's the, that is the result of that secondary specular highlight. Or a bad dye job going out. Or a bad dye job going out, it, it could be as well. Uh, but you can kind of visualize this by adjusting the different tangents. Now I'll talk briefly about what tangents are in just a moment. Uh, and you should not do what I'm about to do, but you can take like tangent A here and just start adjusting the color and you can watch those specular highlights move around. So it's, it's kind of subtle, but you can actually see the white highlight kind of dancing around on his head. And if I go over here to tangent B and start playing with that, it's a little less obvious, but the, the colored uh, highlight is also dancing around a little bit too. It's not painfully obvious, and the reason for that is that the sec... There you go. That, that's a little better, but still not great. The, um, the reason is that the... Uh, the tangent is not really the kind of thing you ever really want to adjust with a color. It's not a color, it's a vector. It should be, uh, in fact, it should be a unit vector. And we'll talk about that. I guess might as well just kind of jump into it. So at a mega high level, uh, I'll actually, let me, ah, here we go. So this is a pretty good representation of what tangent actually is. You should think of it like a, uh, a vector that points from the tip of the hair down toward the base of the hair. And it can actually bend and curl through space to show the shape of the hair as well. This is where you get into flow maps with hair, which is something we kind of talk about uh, here at this point in the documentation. So here's a picture of Sparrow, <clears throat> and then uh, here is just her flow map. Now, before we get like too deep into this, again, my goal isn't to like do a really, really deep dive into all of these shaders right now, but I'll do, I'll do a little baby deep dive, like a tiny little bit of deep yeah, dive. If you, get, if you get one, I think they'll get the gist of the other ones too. Yeah, well, so Tangent is kind of a special beast because Tangent actually requires a, uh, like a special node that you would have to create in your hair shader. And this is a little bit different here. Actually, let me see, let me poke around. Uh, to, to actually find it. So you would actually have to create a tangent node to feed into this because you can use a tangent and a normal map simultaneously and they do two different jobs. Uh, the, at the highest level, you can think of your tangent as the, uh, the direction the hair is moving through space. Uh, or you can also, if it's easier to think of, it would be the direction that the specular highlight would stretch in. Okay. Now, why is this important to you? Uh, try to imagine uh, doing a character who had long hair that was kind of wavy and you don't necessarily want to do all of the geometry to perfectly approximate those waves because at some point that's a lot of vertices. Yes. So the flow map that you generate, so your, first off, your geometry would be relatively flat. It might have a little bit of ripple to it, but it wouldn't be perfect to the shape of the hair. Instead, you would use the flow map to uh, control that specularity, which would make the hair look like it rippled and went in and out because the shine across it would, would dance across in a way that curly hair would. So it's a way that you can get more depth out of the, uh, the hair than you would otherwise. Now, at the same time, this character that we have in our demo doesn't actually use a flow map because technically you do not need one. If you have a character with short hair, you can just, actually I can show you kind of the result. Uh, if we set this hair onto a plane, you'll notice for the most part, his hair is, uh, all these hair planes are oriented in the same direction. Uh, so if you don't, if you have a character with short hair, you can just orient the hair plane such that their bottom is downward and their top is upward. Mm -hmm. And it will kind of generate its own tangent based off of that. Oh, well, so you don't, you don't have to do uh, all that work for a, a short-haired character. But real quick, it's also worth pointing out, uh, here is what this character looks like uh, without his hair shader on. So if we go to like lighting only, you can see we actually still use a whole lot of hair planes to make this a thing. So this is what you'd be, uh, be doing in 3ds Max, right? You'd just be making all of these different planes and uh, maybe you'd run a script or you'd paint them down like a geometry paint tool to start and then you'd start hand tweaking and doing a whole lot of adjustment. Mm -hmm. And that actually answers one of the Q&A questions that uh, I was saving to the end, but uh, that was just it as someone was asking, where would you go about putting that together? So, yeah, yeah. You, you do it inside of Max. Yep. Uh, and there's uh, there are actually some pretty cool training videos uh, that abound on the internet for using 3ds Max's hair system, which is what several of our artists have used to create the hair in uh, on Paragon. It's not the like everybody uses different tools even at Epic. We have different artists who prefer different tools, but kind of the baseline one that most folks use for the hair stuff is uh, is 3ds Max's hair system. So that's that's at least a good place to begin. Uh, so. 
I think that's probably a pretty. Hang on, is there anything I missed? Let me let me kind of scroll back up a little bit. Before Talk we move on from a hair. little bit about an isotropy. It's really just mm -hmm. uh, when you have a specular highlight that is not all in one spot. It kind of stretches out, like you see on brush metal or incidentally on hair. We talked a little bit about scatter. Uh, we have a demo here of all of the different types of texture that you'll see on the <clears> surface. <throat> Uh, so you, there's obviously diffuse and alpha that should be pretty self-explanatory. The root mask is pretty cool. It's just a black to white gradient where black denotes the root of the hair and white denotes the tip. Uh, this is just nice for differentiating the base of the hair from the end in case you want to do something like a two-tone effect like your roots are starting to grow out. Uh, it makes that sort of thing a little bit easier. The depth texture is really just uh, a texture that shows how deep into the body of hair each individual strand would be, where white would be near the surface and black would be as far in as you can go. Uh, it's, it, uh, you would just create this, uh, there's a lot of ways you could make it inside of 3ds Max, you could just randomize it. I think there's actually um, a, a depth out render that you could do. Uh, to create this texture on your own. And the final one is just unique ID. And this is a random grayscale value applied to each and every strand, and it's just there for variation. So you could just uh, maybe do like a, um, use it as the basis for a lerp between different tangent directions and things like that. Okay, uh, the only other kind of random idle thing I'll mention, actually this is worth pointing out, and it's actually easier to show off here than it is in the scene. I do love these sliders we have in our documentation now. Yeah, thank you, Jeff, by the way, for yeah. making sure these work. Jeff, That's... these rock when, when they work, Jeff. When they work, they're <laughs> awesome. Uh, when they show up, but I'll... I'll... I'll pick on him a little more about that in a few minutes. Uh, so the uh, pixel depth offset, it, this is not a hair shader thing. This is actually on all of the different shaders in Unreal. And the idea is that it takes the pixels for a given uh, material and it approximates kind of pushing them toward the camera or, pu or pulling them away. So it's kind of moving them toward or away from you. And you can see the result here. So without pixel depth offset, you can actually see, you can kind of visualize where the the lines of those polygon planes live like you can see how they're intersecting with the head and then by taking a little bit of pixel depth offset or actually it'd be like a small number and multiplying it by the root mask uh, you can start to really make the hair look like it's blending into the hairline uh, i guess a couple of other little things that are of interest and are, are worth pointing out is that we do use uh, edge masking for a lot of the hair so because it, the hair is a whole bunch of planes, usually, it is possible you can view a plane from edge on, right? So like the edge of the polygon points well, right you get at that, you. Like straight, flat, weird effect. Yeah, and like, yeah, yeah, it can start to look really weird. Like you'd have this razor sharp edge of hair that would get really distracting. And as you backed away, that would probably start to get a little jittery in um, temporal anti-aliasing anyway. So it would look like a, a mess. Yeah. So what we do is as a uh, plane starts to rotate toward you, as you start to see it from edge on, we actually fade it out. So it's kind of like a, uh, a Fresnel result. So it starts to kind of disappear as you do that. And this is why a lot of our characters actually have uh, a hair scalp mask. Like we've actually painted some hair right onto their scalp. So as the hair disappears from a given angle, you don't see right down to the skin scalp. It's important to note, because like if you were trying to do this on your own, if you're building your own character, it might seem like you should just do it like it would be in the real world, right? You just have a skin scalp and then you plug hair into it. And that's really not what you would do at all. Okay, so cool. There's um, some hair. So let's jump back over and let's talk. Let's talk about the eyes. Now, the the eyes are a huge topic. Uh, the eyes were a whole lot of work. Wow, that's scary. Look, actually, yeah. that's super cool. Oh, looking. with the depth and everything. Yeah, that's actually super cool looking. Yeah, but what I'm gonna cool, do? That's the word for it. What I'm gonna do to show? Yeah, it's also creepy. <laughs> yeah, very creepy. Uh, to show it off to best effect. Inside the project, which, by the way, if you downloaded the project on launch day, you didn't have this, I'm sorry. I'll take the blame for it, but it wasn't... Oh, no, it's totally my fault. I <laughs> uh, so there is a piece of geometry that didn't ship originally. If you download it right now, you actually do get it. It's called uh, Photoreal Eye Geo. This is actually the geometry of the eyes. You technically had this the whole time, but you would have had to export the head out, take it into some 3D ma a 3D app, and then extra like delete out all the faces that weren't part of the eyeball. So I've done that for you and re-imported it back in. Uh, so if I make this, psh, the model that we're looking at, it's very tiny, but eyeballs tend to be. And now we can take a look at the eye up close. Now, that's not as freaky, I think, as a big plane of eyeball, but it'll help us. So um, the, I guess the first thing I want to launch into is making eyes look good in real time in a game engine is hard. 
There's a lot that goes into it. And uh, if you fancy a cool read, it's actually worth kind of going over uh, how we used to do it. So there's actually a brief section in the documentation that talks about how we handled the eyes on the uh, the kite boy from Tim. A Boy and His Kite. Tim. His name is Tim. His name is Tim. If you actually go into his bag, there's a little thing that says property of Tim. He might have stolen that bag. <gasps> yeah, and consider that. Why else would he be running off into the woods? I thought it was for the kite. It has nothing to do with that. The kite is just coincidental as he's running away. Totally. Oh my gosh. This kid might be a delinquent. We don't know. <sighs> Didn't even think about There's that. a lot of stuff we haven't thought. Look <laughs> at that face. I'm not sure I trust. Okay, anyway. <laughs> anyway, so uh, the way we handled his eyes way back when is actually with two different surfaces. And this is actually a vector render of his real eye geometry uh, that was used in the kite demo. So there is a clear shield that exists on the outside of the geometry, like a separate dome. And that is just to handle specularity and any refraction that you want to do. And then underneath that is a separate piece of geometry that includes the white of the eye or the sclera, uh, and as well as the iris and a little indentation for, uh, for the pupil. So again, it was these two pieces of geometry that always had to kind of move and work together. And you were rendering through one to see the other. And it came with a lot of its own drawbacks, especially given that translucency in the engine uh, means that you have to forego a lot of the uh, benefits to PBR. And essentially, when you switch over to a translucent shader, you lose a lot of the powers of your material. Uh, not, there's a lot of cool things it can do, but you do have to make a lot of trade-offs. So what we've done now is we have a single piece of geometry that is doing all of that work by way of a shader. The reason this is important to, I guess, to pay close attention to is that the way we have written the actual code of this shader, like what's actually going on in the source code of the engine, is very closely tied to the way in which we architected this particular material that you see here. And the two are really inseparable. You're not going to just take this eye shader and play with it by itself. You're not, you're probably, probably not going to take a random material that you just created from scratch, set it to eye shader settings and start constructing from there. The way that we built this is really in tandem with this particular eye material and with this actual particular piece of geometry, which is why we went through the process of separating out, uh, whatever you're doing, don't do it. Uh, this is why we went through the process of saving out the uh, photo real eye geometry as a separate thing to make it easy for you to migrate out or export out and start doing your own thing with. So with that understood, uh, I guess uh, just harping on that you shouldn't be trying to do this from scratch unless you are really, really familiar with uh, writing shaders on your own. We can start taking a look at some of the properties. Now, uh, it's worth pointing out. Oh, actually, this, this is like one of the coolest things. So if we jump back before I get too far away, back in the kite demo, since we had two pieces of geometry, we didn't have to worry too much about refraction because you actually could architect the eye to have an indented iris and pupil. So it was physical geometry that did that. Now it's not. Now, now it's, it's all shader. Yeah, now it's just a single domed surface. And this is what it looks like without refraction. And here's what it looks like with refraction. And if that doesn't really get the point across, we can show this off pretty easily inside of Unreal. Uh, if you look up the depth scale property, which is hiding right here, and we set this to 0, this is what the eye looks like by itself. It's just a shiny surface. And you can actually see it's like the iris and pupil yeah. are just painted right onto the surface. Uh, OK. Are you eye squeamish? Uh, you know, I wasn't. You know, Te Technically, I'm eye squeamish. Uh, like the only times I've ever really just like honestly passed out had to do with gross things happening with eyes. But this doesn't seem to bother me. Now, check it out. As I increase depth scale, watch really closely what happens. And right. as you rotate around, you can actually see that it does have, it does now look like a clear dome of water sitting on top of the yeah. eye. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so this defaults to around 1.2, but I mean, you can really muck with it and create a whole lot of extra depth that you probably don't need. But there you go. And this is all done with like super high-end shader tricks. Now, just for the fun of it, I'll open up the material so you can see it. There's a lot of stuff going on here. Um, you probably aren't going to rebuild this entirely on your own. And even if you did, m keep, tr keep track of things like this. Like we actually have an eye refraction material, uh, material function that we wrote just to help handle this. So there's all kinds of custom stuff going on here. Just be really, really cognizant of that. The way you probably should be using the eye is you'll, you would start with this. You would migrate out the eye shader and the eye geometry that we have. 
you would start there and then start swapping out all of these textures that we've supplied. Yeah. It's, so, it's probably safer to do one thing at a time versus trying to start from scratch, yep. right? Uh, if what you want is a relatively humanoid character uh, that has eyeballs that work any, I mean, even cat's eye kind of slit irises are not that different at the end of the day. And you can actually, like, I've done it. You can get pretty close uh, just by changing out some textures. But, like, for example, we could scroll down and we have, like, pupil scale. So you can use this to dilate the pupils. And if you wanted to, you could start writing, like, clever... Uh, clever blueprints or shaders where if like you shine a light at the character's face it would automatically contract that like oh. you have that kind of power oh that's very interesting uh, so everything you really need to make a really good eye is probably already here there is even a little bit of simulated subsurface scattering already going on here to make it look kind of nice uh, there's even we've even given you the ability to fake a secondary ref uh, reflection here so if you take a look at secondary environment balance and you open this up and start playing with the value on it. What's this creating? Well, oh, actually, oh if, if you, you can crank, see our office. Yeah, if you crank it all the way up, <laughs> it looks like the eyes are kind of chromed, which actually looks really cool yeah. uh, out, in, out in the view, wherever I actually hid the view. I think I've got too many windows open. Let's put this away real quick. Oh. Was around here somewhere? What? Oh, there, oh, there we go. Is. There we go. Ha ha! I knew it was here somewhere. I'm just usually I usually put that on like the. Oh wow, he's my side. favorite X Man already. Look at that. Right. So uh, hit escape to get rid of all the extra garbage. So now he has chrome eyes. Now what that is is just an environment map. So it's a cube map that's already been stuck on there. Normally you're not going to crank this up this high. You would leave it uh, super low, like I don't know 0.015. You're just like the tiniest little amount of reflection based off of a cube map. And then like on top of that, like we gave you. Uh, the ability to rotate that around. So um, I'll try to do this. Actually, let me make it like really apparent what happens here. I'll just I'll kick this up higher than you'd ever see it. So now the eye looks like it's made <clears> of glass <throat> again. Uh, but if you grab the secondary environment rotation, so you can also rotate this around yeah. to make sure that it's aligning with uh, with your environment. Now this would be super important if you were doing like a cinematic cutscene of your character and you had a special cube map of like maybe the character they're talking to so you can see the other character reflected in their uh, eyes, you could align this up just right. I was actually, the first thing I thought was it would be really interesting to do like a character and like do like, you're looking straight at their face and they're going through some like trippy sequence where they're seeing stuff and so you just whip the world around them inside their eyes and zoom in on that. Yeah, you could do things like that. It would be very cool. If you really, really wanted yeah, to. Yeah, you can make that a dynamic parameter, really have fun with that it. It sounds horrible, but I guess you could do it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let me, uh, let me jump back out to, environment. actually I'll just turn that off and it'll it'll go back to normal. So uh, meanwhile, back over here in, in the docks. So all of these different settings, they're all broken down. Not only do we uh, tell you, you know, generally what they do, but we also give you, uh, I'm gonna use finger quotes, ideal values for them. I mean, your mileage may vary and you might wanna make minor changes to them, but overall, these are the values that we generally recommend not to step outside of because then your eye starts looking kind of unrealistic. Okay, so let's see, what else? Uh, so uh, again, just kind of pointing out, it's probably important to use our geometry. Uh, our geometry also has a very special UV layout. It's, it's laid out like a, a dead-on uh, mapping straight from the front of the eye. So I mean, you could make an eye like this on your own, and it's actually not that hard to lay out the UVs in such a way. It's just a planar map from, uh, from head on. But just keep that sort of thing in mind. Like you can actually see what the UV layout looks like. It is a planar map, but you'll notice it's actually been scaled in a little bit, so it doesn't run all the way to the edge like it probably would the, the first time you make that planar map. So there's some editing that would take place. There's also a breakdown of all the different eye textures with an explanation of why they exist and kind of what they do. Mm. And that's pretty it. Also, this is pretty important. The, uh, there is a second normal to kind of help uh, sh uh, to help show off the inside of the iris. There's like a, a secondary normal map there. And we supply that secondary normal by way of a tangent output node, which you have to create separately uh, in order to have access to that. Uh, I guess the last thing, oh, and this is, this is showing up on your end. So maybe, you know what, Jeff, maybe you're right. Maybe, maybe so, it's just you. Maybe it's just me. Uh, yeah. On my machine, this doesn't actually show up. 
Uh, so the last thing is that for the characters in Paragon, we actually have a separate piece of geometry that sits just inside their eyelid. I f uh, Jeff, I'm sorry, man. Actually, I yelled at Jeff. It was in an email, and I didn't yell at him at all. I, I typed in all caps. But uh, the, some of these images weren't actually showing up. It turns out it's not really Jeff's fault. I'm probably going to blame him anyway. So, um, <laughs> this is a good, good strategy. Blame Jeff first. Right. So there's a piece of geometry that we put right inside the eyelid, like right over the surface of the eye. And it has a special shader that just kind of darkens the outside of the eye and supplies a, uh, an approximated or kind of faked ambient occlusion. And if you're wondering, you know, like, why would you ever do that? Well, here it is without it, and here it is with it. So you can see you get much more realistic shadowing across the surface of the eye if you add this on. So you'll definitely want to have this. The reason it's important to keep in mind is that you probably will need this to deform along with the eyelids if you were doing hardcore animation of the eyes, like, like blinking, or depending on how hardcore you're getting, if you're doing... Um, if you're doing like full domed uh, cornea eyes, uh, and if you've ever, I don't know if anybody in here ever rigged up like a face for 3D animation, but as you look to the left and the right and up and down. Oh, they should morph. Yeah, yeah, yeah the to... domes of your corneas will push your eyelids around, so you'll probably have to do like morph targets to make your eyelids move appropriately. Unless you're doing a really cinematic game with a lot of close-ups, I wouldn't recommend you bother. But if you are doing that kind of game, it's the kind of thing you should think about. And in that case, you'll probably want this to deform right along with the eyelid. Like, it should constantly be sealing up the eyelid, uh, more or less, at all times. And you, you just be careful with it. So, that's... That's it. Like, that's the, the length and breadth of the documentation. Again, I didn't want to read you all of the different numbers and dials and stuff. It's, it's all right here for you to look at. The best thing you could probably do is open up this example. Make sure you do read through the documentation. I know our, our TFM is, is it's, it's a little heinous to say that to somebody, but it's really important to read through a lot of this stuff. Uh, and then just play with it, right? Like, grab <coughs> that, uh, that character's head. Uh, reconfigure the the skin. Maybe try to make different skin tones, or you go like full, you know, crazy and do like you know purple skin or whatever you want to do. Uh, and then you know try making your own customized version of the eye. See if you can get uh, start simple, right? Just change the color of the eyes in inside of a in Photoshop or whatever your texture package is, and then see what it would take to get clever and make it look like uh, like cat's eyes, you know, with like slit uh, pupils. It's actually it will for the most part just work, which is kind of nifty. Uh, so that's really all I had for everybody. That's that's awesome. Uh, we we have some Q and A from the audience, Let's of course, too, because yeah, you covered yeah. a lot of things as well. But I just want to make sure that we get everyone's questions uh, handled here. So uh, we already covered the adding a ca uh, camera and the whole depth of field post process stuff that's going on in there. So if yeah, you were asking it, about yeah, just kind of blurriness and, and going on in the yeah, so there. when you when you first bring it in, the textures do look kind of blurrier and washed out, uh, especially if you've added a new camera. So the camera and it, everything in that scene has been really, really, really tweaked. Uh, so there, there's also a couple of hardware considerations. Like if you first open the map, I've seen on some machines, all of the textures look really blurry. If you see that for some silly reason, um, it's not something that should pop up actually in a, in a cooked game. It's just something about the editor loading in the textures and it's doing some automatic mipping. Uh, take the camera, fly it into the character's head and back it back out again and all that stuff goes away. That's an interesting way to solve that. Just fly right into them. Yeah, it takes like two seconds to, to pop. I, it's right. it's just some sort of automatic mipping. I've never seen it uh, translate its way all the way into like a, a cooked build or anything, but I do notice it from time to time in the editor viewport. Let's see here. Um, we might have covered this one here. Is, is there any way to get subsurface scattering in the eye shader? I would have to like talk to Brian to make sure, because I did not write that shader. I'm not qualified. But I think there already is some subsurface uh, scattering approximation taking place there. Otherwise, the, the eyes would look a whole lot flatter than they already do. And they really do not look like a completely opaque, shiny surface. So there's got to be something already taking place there. Cool. Uh, is there a preferred method to generating light colored hair in the hair shader? Uh, oh, old yeah. person gray, for example, or perhaps bright pink? Yeah, grab the base color texture that we supplied you with and modify it. Uh, the problem with the, the one that we gave you is it's already like four dark brown hair. And so you, that kind of limits the amount of range you can play with. So what you'd probably want to do is throw that into something like Photoshop and adjust like curves and maybe a couple of different uh, layer effects to take everything that is brown and start pushing it up toward pale gray. That's what I was just thinking, like a medium gray color and then blending in colors that you like might be a, a better... Yeah, um, it, it's, it's probably, I could probably argue it both ways, like um, up or down probably doesn't really matter. Uh, I'd probably go toward the higher end than, as opposed to the lower end, but but yeah, your mileage may vary. That's where you'd start, though, is you would, you would just uh, lighten up that texture on your own. Very cool. Let's see. Next question here. Um, 
how make... exactly were the hair textures made? Oh, yeah, I guess they were so all rendered out of 3ds Max. Unique, yeah. So we, yeah. we covered all of that one. Um, uh, how were the single hair strands made for the Sparrow character when we were showing off her with the flow maps? Splines. And all that, that's straight yeah, up. We, we actually had a, the, the one with Brian Karras on right. previously. He goes over, yeah, it's, it's just splines. Yeah, you would go into, like, I think they did it in Max, actually. You mm -hmm. would just draw a 3D spline traveling through space. You would make it renderable, which puts a little tube around it. And then that becomes your piece of geometry. Yeah, that's all it is. It's a puffed up piece of spline, and they just hard model that mm -hmm. um, and so that's actually a pretty good point is that if you want to keep realism in your hair those sheets alone might not be enough if they have longer hair sure. you might want to throw in a couple of like strays unless they have perfectly combed hair well it's also uh, worth pointing out too those strays on Sparrow are really only there in the cinematics um, we actually use the same models in the game that we use in the cinematics but there are some additional features that we kill off because there's just no reason to have to render the extra triangles and shaders mm -hmm. and, and, and um, also just being back that far, you're not going to ever notice so many yeah. things, and, and yeah. Yeah. Uh, let's see here. Uh, how, how do, do you, you guys, guys gener generate flow, the maps? flow maps? Yeah, because when you're going over the flow I maps, I think it's it's different for everybody. Uh, there's if you actually take a look at hair flow map tutorial, like if you Google hair flow map tutorials, uh, the ways in which we do it are actually included in like two or three different links that come up really really quick. Uh, there are a few different. I, th I think um, Substance will actually uh, render them out for you. But uh, I haven't uh, like I haven't actually made long hair for any of our Paragon characters, and it, it really varies from artist to artist. But the the actual techniques we use are covered all over the web. It shouldn't be that hard for you to dig up. Awesome. Uh, how many characters with these shaders can you have in the scene before it run into performance problems? Now this is also hardware dependent kind of question, but I would like to open up the scene with the character and just show what uh, like the various performance uh, checks look like, so we can see. Well. And uh, let's see, he is here. Yeah, and if we can just do like the show, um, what is it? Show, and then there's like... What do you want me to show? I'm trying to remember. There's there's a few different ones where we can just like show off how um, like how much is eating up what, etc. Oh, we can do also like uh, bring up the stats video I mean, view and you all can, that. You can do some of the optimization view yeah. modes. Like you can the light look at complexity and shader, shader complexity. complexity. There I you mean, go. That's kind of what I wanted to do here yeah. is get out the shader. So shader his, complexity is probably his, the best one. Yeah, his hair gets a little expensive, but that's mostly yeah. overdraw. Yeah. Because all these different planes are going to have to render on top of each other. So mm -hmm. that's something that uh, on, a, on a real game, you'd probably want to lob that out pretty quick uh, to make that become less of a thing. Um, yeah, you can see quad overdraw showing very similar stuff here. So this is the, the pixel shaders really having to be hammered uh, all throughout the hair. So again, as you got farther and farther away, you'd want to lod that down. So you might have a, a, a lod or LOD, however you like to say it, on your character that maybe like at a distance is more like a hair helmet. Uh, and then you would fade out to that as he got far enough away. So that would make things a lot simpler. And choices like that, decisions like that, are really going to mean you can put a lot more on the screen at, at one given time. But it's... I love those types of questions, in the, especially since there's really no one way to answer them. Uh, on a standard, uh, look, I'm going to call a, a standard today game spec computer, and if I'm insulting you, I'm really sorry. Uh, we'll so, so something like a 970, right? Um, that's standard. Yeah, I don't know. I have no, I have no idea. I mean, I have a 980 Ti, but that's like considered pretty decent. Do you I work guess. at Epic? I mean, yeah. It's, okay. But that's at home. I mean. <laughs> yeah, like I don't even know what people are, are running these days, and it's it. It would be impossible for me to, to guess because there's a, a really already so many other things that would factor into that. Like uh, your GPU could be doing all sorts of other things based on the number of uh, particles you have in your scene, the, no the amount of post-processing you're doing, not to mention the number of lights in your scene. Like there's so many different ways to bottleneck that it's impossible to look at something like this and say, oh, how many of these can I have on the screen? Because the answer is always going to be the same. Well, it depends on everything else you're doing the same. Mm -hmm. uh, in a vacuum where you only had these, I, I really don't know. It's probably worth pointing out though that I mean, we maintain 60 on uh, PS4 mm -hmm. with this same content. Uh, we do lot it down. We do stay really uh, cognizant of how we're using resources. Uh, we maintain, uh, the game is actually set up in such a way that it maintains uh, like its own relevancy checks. So th things that you're not actually looking at or things that are far away from you, not entirely in focus. Like if you're actually shooting at this guy, but there's something happening over here, we've deemed that this thing you're shooting at is probably more relevant. And we, uh, we render that at, at higher levels of detail, things like that. So it, it's just a deep question. I really wish I had a more solid answer for you. What, uh, the best answer for it would be build the game that you like that uses these features and then test, because that's exactly what we do. Yep, uh, and then we kind of optimize and change around from there too. Um, 
So I, we're actually running a little bit tight on time. A couple of people were asking also to turn on like stat FPS and, and turn on a couple things like that, which actually the reason I wanted to show the density ones and not the stat FPS is because the stat FPS isn't going to be fair. There's a Titan X in this machine in particular so that we always have nice smooth I pretty everything. much never use stat FPS. Yeah, so it wouldn't do you much good. We could show it, but the number would be very particular yeah. to this machine oh, yeah. and it, how powerful it is. So even if you run stat FPS so. on the scene uh, on on any computer that is qualified to run the engine, it'll probably be fine. Yeah. It probably won't be that big of a deal. Uh, but stat FPS alone doesn't really tell you anything useful. Um, stat unit will start to help a little bit. Um, and then from there, it's like you can start dumping frames and doing uh, GPU profile, may, probably not CPU profile on this. I don't think it really matters. What I recommend you do if you really care about this, uh, this sort of thing is start reading up on render doc. Uh, a member of the, of the community has already written a really good uh, render doc plug in for the engine that I actually use to, to test out my stuff. So anyway, All right, uh, I'll, so I'll throw out that little plug just to, to get people thinking Check about out it. RenderDoc. It's yeah. good. It's good. Um, but that's all the time that we have today. Zach, thank you so much for coming out. We learned a lot. Here. This yeah. was really exciting. Thank you, Clint, by the way. You're awesome. You're, You're the man. Um, and thank you all for coming out. Make sure to hit like, subscribe, all the different buttons on all the various forms of social media, et cetera, et cetera. We're, on, we're broadcasting to so many different places now. So please make sure that you're following us so that next time that we have a stream, you know about it because it'll be next Tuesday because we're always Tuesdays and Thursdays at 2 p.m. Eastern time. So we'll see you then. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank mm -hmm. you.